middle of the afternoon, usually time, a good time for a coffee break. Who here loves going for a coffee with friends? I thought everyone, but okay. <laughs> How about going out for coffee with a friend that you recently had a disagreement with? Just one, two, three, oh, a few, okay. <laughs> Maybe for most of us, just the thought of that makes us feel a bit uneasy. Why are these conversations difficult? Many of us would have some experience. These conversations take time, take energy, we have to expose ourselves, we have to go through the emotions, and we don't know what will come out of it. It may get worse. Or we may think, what's the point? That person is not going to change his or her mind. But we still want to try sometimes. Why? Because these may be people we care about. They may be our family, our friends, people we share a community with, Maybe same school, same office, same neighborhood. There are people we see every day, and we would like to be able to connect with them if we can. For those of us familiar with Hong Kong pop music, you may recognize Shall We Talk as the title of a song by Ethan Chan. The song is about relationships drifting apart and individuals asking why that has happened. Indeed, to keep talking and not disengage is key to maintaining a relationship, at least a relationship we care about. But today, I'm inviting you not only to talk, but to dialogue. So what is the difference? And why is this topic important to me? Perhaps my interest in difficult conversations and dialogues is only a natural product of my journey. First, a law student, then a journalist, then working in international development, and then back to law. And from all these experiences, I've learned one thing. No matter how complex an issue is, to find a way out, and sometimes it may take years, it always comes down to the people and understanding these individuals. So let me share a, a few aha moments in my journey learning about dialogue. My first story involves an orange. And this is a story I learned in my first negotiation class ever 10 years ago. Imagine you're a parent and you have two young children. You had a long day of work, you come back home and they're both crying, wanting to have the only orange left in the kitchen. And they insist of having the whole orange. So what do you do? You're super tired. Do you just give it to the child that cries the loudest? Or do you cut it in half, leaving both of them unhappy? Or you may spend a few minutes trying to ask them, so why exactly do you want the whole orange? In this case, a child may tell you what he really wanted to do is to make orange juice. And the other child, conveniently, in this hypothetical example, <laughs> may tell you she really wanted to make orange cookies, which means she only needs the orange zest. So in this case, if you ask, you will find out more about what each party really wants. And a seemingly deadlock situation may not be as deadlock as it seems. So that's my first element of dialogue. Be curious and ask questions. My second story, it's really about my bumpy start with the study of law, how I almost dropped out of it, and how anthropology saves that relationship. At 18, I wanted to study law because of all the legal dramas I grew up watching, and also because I thought law can help people. However, in my first few weeks in law school, I found the subject so dry and abstract that I was really struggling, and I hope my bosses today are not listening to this. I was desperately trying to find a subject to switch to before I failed my classes. And that's when I sat in the class of the late Professor Simon Roberts. And that class is legal anthropology. 
I'm not going to pretend. I hardly knew what anthropology was at that time. And I find it a nice coincidence that CUHK is the only university in Hong Kong that has anthropology. In fact, I think most people still confuse anthropology with archaeology. And they think we study dinosaurs. But far from it. Anthropology studies societies and cultures and what hold these societies together, be it religious beliefs or family structures. And when it comes to law, legal anthropologists have learned from the small-scale societies that they study that even if a society doesn't have a written set, written body of laws, or a court where judges hand down decisions, it doesn't mean that they don't have a legal system. It doesn't mean they don't have a system to maintain order and resolve disputes. For example, Professor Roberts is famous for his study of an indigenous community in Botswana. And he has observed that their community elders play a key role in the dispute resolution. Sometimes they may be acting as judges, but actually most of the time they're acting as mediators, helping the individuals resolve disputes themselves. I later learned that Professor Roberts is a pioneer of the ADR reform in the UK, ADR standing for Alternative Dispute Resolution. And he drew on his experience as a legal anthropologist to do that. So it was eye-opening for me to learn that there are more ways to resolve disputes than litigation. But more importantly, anthropology taught me always be aware of your preconceptions when you study another culture. And the same applies to when you're learning about another person. Understand context, including your own. That's my second element of dialogue. My third story is actually my, one of my first stories as a young journalist. This was back in 2006. And I remember reading about police busting a shelter of 13 refugees. And they were described as overstayers, as lawbreakers. I had never met an asylum seeker by this point. So I reached out through an NGO and got connected to a family from Central Africa. I still remember that afternoon by the harbor front where the wife told me the heartbreak they had to go through when they had to flee the country in such a rush that they couldn't fetch their four-year-old daughter from a hideaway. I also remember the husband telling me how without a permission to work in Hong Kong, there are days where they had to lift off table scraps from McDonald's. I used to think I can lose everything but dignity, he said. He used to be a wealthy trader back home, but that all changed when he helped the opposition party expose corruption in the government. As a lawyer, with my legal background, I was as a journalist then, um, I focus a lot of the story on the legal limbo that these asylum seekers face. But really, for me personally, this was a story about meeting a family from across the globe, very different backgrounds, very different circumstances, but at that moment, we really connected as fellow human being and how I wish that all of us would have equal access to life and protection. So writing this story cemented in my mind that behind every news headline, it is ultimately a human story. Together, these three stories give me the first three elements of dialogue. Be curious and ask questions. Understand context, including your own and ask, what is the human story? As I think back, all these three elements have played a key role in every job I have taken on in my career, whether as a journalist covering China for seven years or as an Asia program manager for an international NGO, matchmaking pro bono lawyers and law students with over hundreds of NGOs across Asia, working on a range of challenging social and environmental causes from human trafficking to gender inequality. Even now, back at a law firm, as a lawyer who specializes in impact investing and ESG, it is still about dialogue to me. 
It is about working with investors and companies who believe that it is no longer enough to just seek financial return, but it is important to hear those long neglected missing voices, be it the environment or your employees, workers along the supply chain or communities that you do business in. At the heart of every role, it has been fostering dialogues and understanding for me. And every switch that I made, it is because I saw a new opportunity that I thought I can better apply my skills and experience to foster a dialogue that I care about. However, it is really a small side project that got me thinking a lot deeper about dialogue and in our everyday life. In November 2019, two good friends, Benita and Fiona, both of them here, and I decided to start a happy hour for more regular connection with friends. As we were seeing wearing divides amongst friends and family and people around us, we thought the least we could do is to keep talking. And this was the beginning of Hong Kong Dialogue Hour. We didn't start it as a project, but today we have held over 35 sessions and every time we have about a dozen participants joining us to discuss a topic of controversial or difficult conversations. And these topics have covered everything from frustrating COVID-19 policies, to discrimination, to mental health, to sex, and even death. If you ask me what is Hong Kong Dialogue Hour about with one metaphor, I would say it is like a gym where you go and exercise your dialogue muscles. And they are talking and listening. We use a range of tools and games to facilitate these uh, difficult conversations. And one of them is called Chatkapju, Seven Level Picks. And this is a game where we would pick a hot topic of that month. Say, for example, should Twitter ban Trump's account back in January 2021? And then we will ask our participants to pick a position along a scale of one to seven. If you feel strongly yes about that question, then you pick seven. If you feel strongly no to that question, then you pick one. And then you can also pick anywhere in between if you don't have a strong position. We then invite you to talk to people around you first, and then people further away from you, and then perhaps people at the other end, and then you can pick again. Many participants find it very surprising that despite where they initially stand, even including those on the two ends, that actually they find values they can share with other participants. And it may just be that the strategies to safeguard those values are different. So say, for example, in the Trump case, if you pick seven, yes, definitely, Ben Trump's account. It doesn't mean that you don't care about free speech. It may just be your concern about how to prevent hate speech. Or if you picked one, definitely no, you shouldn't ban the account. Never should you ban the account. It doesn't mean that you're a big Trump supporter. It may just mean that you're worried about Twitter exercising powers that without transparency, and that may stifle more innocent speeches in the future. However, in our everyday life, we may not hear these nuances because we may stop at labels, we'll make assumptions, and we may simply stop listening. And this brings me to the secret ingredient to it all, the fourth element of dialogue, active listening. Have you ever tried to stay silent for about 30 seconds, or one minute or more, and try to really listen to someone who's talking to you. Most of the time, when we think we're listening, we may not be listening. We are probably busy thinking of a response, a counter-argument, a solution, or even that phone text message that we were just reading. Participants, when they do this game with us, which we call slow dating, 
they usually find it a bit weird in the beginning to stay silent. But they also find it surprising that they feel more connected with the other person after the game, especially if we ask them to recap not only the words that they hear, but the emotions that they hear. Someone may be telling you that they're angry or frustrated, but perhaps what they're really experiencing is that they are scared and they're worried. And if so, what are they scared or worried about? And sometimes the discussions do get heated, and this is when we really get to test what we've learned. Can you hold your tongue, slow down, continue to ask questions and listen before you throw that rebuttal back at the other person? Of course, this is also where we will come in and remind participants that dialogue is not a debate. You're not trying to win an argument here. You're not trying to change the other person's position. But really, we're trying to understand each other. And ultimately, it is also about understanding yourself. A lot of participants have said how this exercise has helped them really understand the factors that have shaped their thinking a lot more, be it their upbringing, the privilege they have enjoyed, the struggles they've been through, their ethnicity, their gender, their age. Ultimately, it is also a dialogue with yourself. So here are all four elements of dialogue for me. Be curious and ask questions. Understand the context, including your own. What is the human story here? And active listening. Many researchers have already shown that with social media, algorithm, and AI, we live in an unprecedentedly connected world, but also an unprecedentedly fragmented world. More and more of us are living in echo chambers. It's harder and harder to detect fake news and misinformation. Anonymous comments allow more negative emotions to be unleashed online without accountability. It may just feel paralyzing thinking about all that. However, there may also be little things that we can do every day to counter that. With today's theme being resonance, I invite you all to think more about how we can build trust and connections, to focus more on what we share in common. What are some of the little dialogue steps that we can practice every day? A very close family member and myself, we have rather different political viewpoints, and many times we have said we're never going to talk to each other. But we did. And we have committed ourselves to continue to share news articles that we find insightful with each other and to continue to discuss them. That is, on a day when we are in a good mood. Would you also consider inviting that friend that you recently had a disagreement with out for a heart-to-heart -heart chat? Or you may think it is easier to start with a stranger. And as a lawyer, we love to ask for definitions. And here I'm going to end on one with you. Dialogue is usually used as a noun, but I encourage you to think of it as a verb, as a way to act and think, and something that we can practice every day. And as as someone who loves stories, I invite you to think about dialogue in a sim simpler way. It is simply a way to discover stories, stories of people around you, and stories that you may never find out unless you ask. Thank you.